The world is warming. Some of this warming was almost certainly caused by man. We need to take action. At last, we scientists have gotten the attention of leaders from 195 countries who agreed in Paris that global warming is a major problem and that we must work together now to reduce the warming. This is great news. But as we take this giant step forward, a serious crack is forming in the foundation of greenhouse warming theory. What if we spend trillions of dollars to reduce greenhouse gases and have little effect on observed warming? Impossible, you say. Thousands of climate scientists agree that warming is caused by increased concentrations of greenhouse gases. You must be uninformed, one of those crazy skeptics, or taking money from an energy company. None of the above. I'm a retired senior government scientist spending my children's inheritance just trying to understand if we have the science right. In 2006, I discovered a fundamental enigma in climate science. After evaluating the data carefully, I realized that resolving this enigma might turn out to be very important. Being retired, I was able to devote my full-time effort for a decade to reevaluating the major assumptions made in greenhouse warming theory. What I have discovered is, in hindsight, surprisingly clear. The fundamental problem is how we think about and how we calculate radiant thermal energy. Thermal energy is the oscillation of all the bonds that hold matter together. Thermal energy is an, an intensive physical property that does not depend on the extent of material involved. Thermal energy is, therefore, an intensive physical property that is not additive. You cannot sum up watts per square meter. You cannot integrate energy as a function of bandwidth. Thermal energy is a function of a broad spectrum of frequencies and amplitudes of these microscopic oscillations. We need to talk about a level of energy and then how much energy exists at this level. This affects how much heat flows. Let's take a very simple example. Temperature is an indicator of the level of thermal energy contained in water. If you have five glasses of water, all at the same temperature, and you pour them into one pot, you now have five times the amount of water in that pot compared to one glass. But all the water is still at the same energy level, the same temperature. The temperature does not rise to five times the original temperature temperature is not additive. You do not get a physically meaningful result when you add temperatures together. We all know this from practical experience. Microscopic thermal energy, the basis for temperature, is also not additive in matter, in air, or in space. It is an intensive physical property. Current climate models and the whole radiative forcing approach to global warming, however, add thermal energy together, integrating over bandwidth, substantially overestimating the amount of energy in infrared radiation absorbed by greenhouse gases. Climate models calculate that there is far more energy in the infrared absorbed by greenhouse gases than in ultraviolet B radiation reaching Earth when ozone is depleted. Yet this doesn't make sense. We all know that we get very hot standing in the ultraviolet sunlight. We might even get sunburned. Yet standing outside at night with infrared radiation welling up around us, we barely keep warm and we'll never get sunburned. Which has higher energy? Which feels hotter? Ultraviolet radiation or infrared radiation? Ultraviolet B radiation is actually 48 times more energetic, 48 times hotter than infrared radiation absorbed most strongly by carbon dioxide. The higher the thermal energy, the higher the temperature to which the absorbing body can be raised. Let me repeat this very important point. The higher the thermal energy, the hotter the thermal radiation, the higher the temperature to which the absorbing body can be raised. 
Electromagnetic radiation varies in energy from very low energy radio signals to microwave, to infrared, to visible light, to ultraviolet, to x-rays, to very high energy gamma rays. This infrared energy absorbed by greenhouse gases is just not all that energetic. It's not all that hot. We all know that the ozone layer protects life on Earth by absorbing most solar ultraviolet B radiation before it can reach Earth and damage DNA. When the ozone layer is depleted by human manufactured CFC gases or by effusive basaltic volcanoes, more ultraviolet B radiation than normal is observed to reach Earth, providing a more direct, more logical, and more complete explanation for the details of global warming observed over the past hundred years and throughout Earth history. Now the purpose of this video is not to convince you of this reality. You need to study the details, look at the data, consider the different points of view, and decide what you conclude best explains observations. The purpose of this video is to talk about our mutual responsibility to society as scientists to engage in this debate right now. Ralph Cicerone, president of the National Academy of Science, writes, scientific information is a vital component of the evidence required for societies to make sensible policy decisions. We need to be sure that the science used to make public policy is up to date and as accurate as possible. It's taken many years to get consensus behind the concept that increasing greenhouse gases causes global warming. It's only human to want to defend this greenhouse consensus strongly. But consensus is the stuff of politics. Debate is the stuff of science. As you well know, science is never settled. Scientists always need to be open to important new observations and theories. As Mark Twain put it, what gets us into trouble is not what we don't know. It's what we know for sure that just ain't so. In this case, society is about to spend large amounts of money reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Many businesses will fail. Others may flourish. Many lives will be changed substantially, some for better, some for worse. What if current climate models are wrong? What if the world does not continue to heat as much as climate models predict? After all, these models have not predicted observed temperatures correctly since 1998. Are we really sure they can predict decades into the future? Current climate models cannot explain the following observations directly. I'm well aware that there are hundreds of peer-reviewed papers asserting natural variability and numerous other possible causes. But is this just arm-waving? Climate models cannot explain directly, without rationalization, why temperatures have barely changed from 1945 to 1970 why they rose sharply from 1970 to 1998, and why they remain nearly constant from 1998 to 2013, why they began rising even more quickly in 2014, why 2015 is the hottest year on record, why January 2016 is the hottest January on record, why February 2016 is the hottest February on record, why the polar vortex has become a major issue since 2014, and why your risk of sunburn has increased substantially since 1970. All of these issues are explained clearly, succinctly, and completely without arm-waving rationalization by ozone depletion theory, which most climate scientists simply dismiss because climate models underestimate the energy in the ultraviolet. Now I've discussed this energy problem with dozens of leading climate scientists. Most scientists simply cannot even consider the possibility 
that there could be the slightest chance of any problem with greenhouse warming theory. They do not offer any reason for why I must be wrong, but they are just sure that since I do not agree with the consensus, I must be wrong. Remember, there was a time when the consensus was sure that Earth was flat and that the sun revolved around Earth. This is not the time to put your heads in the sand. We've gotten the attention of world leaders, and they are depending on us. We owe it to society to get on with the debate promptly. The details are explained at my website, whyclimatechanges.com, and the coupled and fully referenced scientific website, ozonedepletiontheory.info. The details are also explained in my new book, What Really Causes Global Warming, Greenhouse Gases or Ozone Depletion available on the website or from Amazon and most other booksellers on internet. I understand the fundamental problem with current climate models. If you want to under understand that, please read my paper, Thermal Radiative Energy is Not Additive. It's been submitted for publication to a physics journal, but is available now on my website. Also read my new paper, Ozone Depletion Explains Global Warming accepted for publication to be published soon, but also available on my website. It explains why ozone depletion explains global warming much better than greenhouse gases. Watch the 15-minute video of my talk at the National Meeting of the American Meteorological Society on January 12, 2016. Did you know that it's never been shown experimentally that increasing the concentration of carbon dioxide in air will actually cause substantial warming of the air. This is why on November 12, 2015, I issued the Climate Change Challenge, offering $10,000 of my children's inheritance to the first person or team of people who can demonstrate through direct measurements in the laboratory or in the field that a 15% increase in carbon dioxide such as that observed from 1970 to 1998, can actually cause more warming of Earth than caused by observed contemporaneous depletion of the ozone layer of up to as much as 60%. As Daniel Borstein, Librarian of Congress, said in 1984, the greatest obstacle to discovery is not ignorance. It is the illusion of knowledge. It is very important for all life on Earth that we get on with this debate right now. To facilitate debate, I've established a Google discussion group on the science of ozone depletion, where posts should be limited to providing new information, analyses, thoughts, references, discussing support for or against the details of the science of ozone depletion. Thank you very much.